Do 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 Announcer man at your service. Do 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 Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Don't go changing to try and please me. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. I love you just the way you are. You do realize we're recording. What? No. Yes. In fact, this is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Oh. This is the flagship. We probably better not include that outtake thing there. Well, then ask the robot to cut it out. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> the robot. I haven't resurrected him yet. <laughs> no. No, thank Shoot. goodness. I'm okay. screwed. That's how we've managed to have so many episodes this year. Okay. Well, I'm Big Anklevich, one of your hosts. And I'm Rish Outfield, one of your hosts. And don't forget, announcer man. Not one of the hosts. <clears throat> uh, we got a story for you today. It is another one of our triple word score contest winners. Okay, here we go. You want to tell the folks real quick what the uh, rules were for the triple word score contest, please? In Not case they all. didn't no. listen to one of the last eight episodes <laughs> in which we also included that. Yeah, I can't imagine anybody is not sick to death of hearing this, but let's see how fast I can explain it. Ready, guys? Start the timer now. We gave each contestant... I can't do it fast. Dude, you suck. Beautiful. Uh, we need one of those lawyer guys that like talks at the end of the... I was actually going to suggest... Because genital bleeding. Yeah, I was going to suggest that you speed it up like they do, where they actually take these words and then compress them into half the time that he actually said it. And he was at that time talking like the Micro Machine guy to begin with. Lame. Did that guy have a name? He did, didn't he? Yeah, it was John Mochimata or something like that. He did the voice of Blur on Transformers. <laughs> Uh, okay, so... Friend, find, look behind. Oh, that was no, that was wheelie. <laughs> but basically, each contestant was given three words at random that they had to incorporate into their story. And it had to be a short story, but it could be about anything as long as they used those three words. And who uh, wrote today's story? Today's story was by Bria Burton. The story is called Switching. And the three words that she had were... Violin... Eeriness and morbidly obese person, which is actually three words on its own, but it is one word. I think when we got the words submitted to us, some people, they were required to submit nouns and some people submitted adverbs like morbidly or maybe it was even morbidly obese. I think it was morbidly obese. And we added person to it so that it became an actual noun. Yeah, eerie was like that as well. I put ness. Yeah, yeah, that's right. She got all the the not actual nouns as her words. But she managed to uh, work them all in, which is impressive. So uh, we're going to go ahead and, and play the story, let you listen to it. And then on the other side, we've got, you know, answers to some important questions. No. As well as other bs for yeah. you to listen to but be, answer me this important question who produced oh, switching good question today's story was produced by wendy cooper really yeah what's the catch <laughs> i think she wanted to pay us back for all those outtakes that were specifically for wendy and so uh, she has produced the episode for us today. And I think she did a pretty darn good job. She also narrated the episode. But we'll talk about that in the cast list on the other side of the story. So without any further ado. Ado. That's the word you're looking for. No, I was done. I oh. was just going to end right there. And then the title was going to start up. Okay. Switching by Bria Burton My eyelids fluttered open. I squinted against light shining into my pupils. Some man held a tiny flashlight, flicking it back and forth, equally assaulting each of my eyes. Can you hear me? He asked. I nodded, unsure what had happened. 
I was flat on my back on hardwood, but I didn't remember falling. Nasty tumble. I think you fainted, Veronica. Who? I didn't say it aloud, but the pit of my stomach lurched. Who was Veronica? Why was I Veronica? As I attempted to sit up, the truth surfaced with a familiar eeriness. It had happened again. The weight of elephants on my chest prevented me from lifting more than my head. I lay in an off-stage area. I heard distant cheering. The stage must be around the corner. I looked down the length of my body. My arms were the size of overweight legs. My stomach bulged, blocking my lower limbs, but I could feel their heft. The ache in my gut told me I might vomit. Please, no more. We've been over this. Tight, female voice, British, unfriendly. I tilted my head back. The woman standing over me wearing a black pantsuit was thin as a rail. Veronica, you are a morbidly obese person. You have to do something about it or your career as a professional violinist will slip from your fingers faster than... All the star systems slip through Governor Tarkin's fingers, interrupted the man at my right. He looked absolutely serious. The more I studied him in the dim backstage lights, the younger he looked. His hair was licked back, and his teeth were crooked in front. His pinstripe suit had made him appear older. Listen, please. I slapped my hand over my mouth. The high-pitched, mousy voice shocked me. It wasn't my voice. This wasn't my body. Why did this keep happening? Last time, I thought for sure, must be the last time. Sarah Kimball, 22, was a college student studying architecture. She weighed 285 pounds. When we switched, I lost 150 of those pounds. She wrote in her journal about a boy she liked, a science major who made me want to gag. Once I slimmed her down, he chased after me. Or her, I mean. That was about the time I woke up back in my own body. As far as I know, they're still together. Before that, Rachel Prentice, 30, a paralegal. She was in love with a prosecuting attorney. At 260 pounds and only 5 foot 4, she had developed type 2 diabetes about a year prior. I had to stab myself with that wretched needle for four months. By the time I switched into Rachel, I was getting good at losing weight fast. Within two weeks on Atkins, I lost 30 pounds. I walked until I could add running. I did a combination of diets over three months that seemed to produce the fastest results with running, walking, interval training. In the last month, I juiced fruits and veggies almost exclusively. That flushed out the remaining fat and toxins in Rachel's body. My last moments is her. I sat in a doctor's office receiving good news. She no longer needed medication to manage her blood sugar levels. Later, she started dating the attorney. Thirteen out of the fifteen women had been in unrequited love. My apparent purpose was to help them lose weight to win the guy. Something told me Veronica loved this nerd in a pinstripe suit who now stroked my hand. Drink this. A female stagehand gave me water. I sipped. Thanks. I'm all right. Just need a hand. It took four people to hoist me to my feet, and it wasn't graceful. I had on ridiculously high heels. No wonder she fell. The knee-length dress insisted on sliding up. Luckily, I didn't care. This wasn't me. And it wasn't my body. With any luck, I'd switch back soon. Veronica was tall. Upright, Nerd came to my shoulder, and he wasn't short. Without heels, she'd still be taller than him. How embarrassing for her. Here, if you're ready. The stagehand presented me with a violin and bow. Of course, we can always cancel your portion of the concert, said the British woman. Cancel? You're okay, right? Nerd asked. I stared between the three of them, British woman, smug and appearing to desire my failure, stagehand with an instrument I'd never touched my entire life, nerd gesturing like an idiot, waving as if he could levitate the violin into my hands. A wave of apprehension rushed in through my pores. I never got used to strangers and their expectations. Hannah Soto, 33, was an air traffic controller. Waking up in her 210-pound body during her shift had been a nightmare. This was not quite as bad as that. More at par with Geneva Gomez, 29 and 240. She was a Spanish teacher. I don't speak Spanish. Just as I did then, I turned and started walking toward what I assumed was the nearest exit. 
I maneuvered in the heels better than anticipated. Uh, Veronica! Nerd easily rushed ahead of me. Uh, where are you going? I can't do this. I'm sorry. I need to go home. I wasn't talking about the concert. Are you sure? He stopped, preventing me from taking another step. His hand rested on my plump arm. I'll drive if that's what you really want. Would you do that for me? Early on, around switch number three, I learned to play up the distressed damsel. Distressed about what? It didn't seem to matter. If Nerd even slightly returned Veronica's feelings, he would usually turn out to be the best helper in my situation. Not knowing a thing about a person makes it difficult to find out where they live, what they do, violinist check, and how to behave around the people they know. If I can't talk about something due to distress, it covers a multitude of errors as I blunder through the first few days, sometimes weeks, navigating my latest switch. Except I didn't want to do this anymore. I wanted my own body, my own life. I didn't even know how or why the switching started. I liked helping people lose weight, and I was good at it. But I had unrequited love, too. From what I could tell, none of the women I had switched with had gotten me any closer to dating Ian. Nerd led me to an SUV with more stickers than bumper. Mostly Star Wars and Star Trek themes and quotes I gathered. As I walked towards the passenger side, he passed me to lift the door handle. Gentlemen. Where are your keys? He asked. In my extensive experience switching, I learned to think and respond quickly. Oh, shoot. Look at me. I presented empty hands. My purse must be inside. Wait here. Nerd dashed off with a kind of speed that implied he might be the one in love with Veronica. The request for keys meant this was her car. Therefore, she was as much of a nerd as nerd. Perfect match. Another common problem switching names. I couldn't ask Nerd his name because Veronica already knew. I did my best to prevent suspicion on the woman, although some exceptions had likely occurred without my knowledge. One time, true disaster struck when it turned out Mary Ellen Rickert, 25, had a peanut allergy. The man injecting the EpiPen, Roger Medford, was the most beautiful cowboy I'd ever seen. It wasn't hard to be in love with him. I got her down from 250 to 150. Due to her height and bone structure, that was the best I could do. She was a big girl, but also striking with all the weight gone. I could tell Roger loved her no matter what, and he married Mary Ellen last spring. Nerd rushed back to the car, carrying a large coach purse. Emily is ticked. She's using English words I've never heard of. <laughs> he chuckled. I laughed, mimicking him. Another strategy. So maybe Emily was her violin instructor? I sighed because I didn't even care. Piecing a life together required time, and I lost energy for it. How could I get myself switched back? I searched through the messy purse, piled with makeup, shaking it. Keys jingled. I reached in and gave them to Nerd. He opened the door. After you. I grabbed the overhead handle to hoist myself up. 240 if I had to guess with Veronica's height and belly size. Seated, I noticed her legs for the first time. She actually had shapely, only slightly overweight legs. Good jeans. I flipped down the mirror to see a lovely face peering back at me. High cheekbones, dark eyebrows, full lips. She could probably model if I lost enough weight for her, which I wasn't in the mood to do. Her aspirations were as a violinist. Twenty or thirty pounds might suffice. Surely she could do that on her own. Nerd backed out of the parking place and pulled onto a two-lane highway headed east. I took in my surroundings and the number of cornfields implied Midwest. Not many of the women had lived out in the sticks, but that's where we were headed. Don't mind Emily about your weight, either. Nerd said conversationally. You know I think you're beautiful just as you are. I smiled. Most of the women heard that comment from a girlfriend, a mother, a father, sister, or brother. Not often did they hear it from men. Thank you. You forgot this at home. I meant to give it to you inside. Nerd pulled a ring out of his pocket and dropped it into my hand. I stared at the gold band with a heart-shaped diamond. This was a first. It perfectly fit her pudgy ring finger. When I noticed Nerd's left hand on the steering wheel, I gasped. Gold band. Veronica and Nerd were married. 
Every switch involved me helping people fall in love by losing weight for them. Veronica's husband liked her as is. Why was I here? I'm ready to switch back now. Veronica doesn't need anything from me. I'd never tried anything like this before, and I didn't know whom to address. Nerd gave me the strangest look. What did you say? Then he was gone. My eyes fluttered open. A man with blue irises stared at me from the side of a hospital bed. Ian. What happened? My voice. What a relief. You're back here again. But maybe it's time you got some real help. Please? Will you do it for me, Crystal? Ian pleaded. For him, I'd do anything. But why was he even here? What had Veronica done in so little time? You asked me for this when she woke up. Ian lifted something flat and shiny. Veronica had wanted a mirror. I lifted my arm out from under the blanket. It was a tan, skeletal arm with an IV. I stared, shocked. My hand took the mirror from him. What happened to me? I peered into an emaciated face I hardly recognized. I found myself in the brown eyes staring back. You've got to take care of yourself. Remember back in high school? You were so pretty. He showed me a picture. Had Veronica suggested that too? The girl was me with a thick waist, but I had been pretty. What went wrong? How did my weight loss turn into this? Ever since high school, my reflection showed large arms, big belly, fat face. Seeing the truth was eerier than switching. Veronica figured it out. Only my unrequited love could hand me the mirror before I truly saw what I had done to myself, before I stopped seeing a fat girl. Now I knew he cared at least a little. Enough to come here. Thanks, Ian. It's time I gained some weight. All right, so there you go. Switching by Bria Burton. You know, Bria actually sent us uh, an author's note for this story too. Oh, we haven't had that happen, have yeah, we? Yeah, should we, should we play it? Sure. We haven't done that with the triple word score stories. We've just done the three questions. But Bria, she's obviously a fan of the show, and so she knows that we usually do uh, author's notes. So she had one all set up for us. So let's listen to it real quick. Don't get changing. Try and please, please me. me. What the crap? Wouldn't want you to go that far. Mm -hmm. Singing again. That's my cue to leave. Hi, this is Bria Burton, author of Switching. I hope you enjoyed the story. My three words immediately sparked ideas for how to begin. I wanted a strong, speculative element, but I wasn't sure how to end it. The notion of Crystal as an anorexic struck about three-quarters of the way through. That factor had potential to shift the story in a way that made her less reliable as a narrator. My hope is that readers will find multiple ways to interpret the story. From time to time, I share my two cents over at the Dune Steve and Journey Into forums, where you'll discover that I enjoy running, when I'm not hating it. I primarily write speculative fiction. My family-friendly ebook series, Lance and Ringo Tales, is on Amazon. I have short story publications in fiction on the web and e-fantasy. My sci-fi piece, Lygia, was selected as one of the winners in the Edgar Allan Poe Writing Contest, which will air on the Journey Into podcast in January 2014. I'm an active member of the Florida Writers Association with short story publications in FWA collections. My website is BriaBurton.com. All right, so there you go. She has something that will be appearing in January 2014. Get ready for it. Set your calendar. Mark your watch. Or whatever it is that you do with those implements. <laughs> We're way behind. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was funny because when she sent us this author's note, she sent us an author's note, and then she sent us another one saying, hey, actually, here's a, an updated revised one, as long as it's not too late. <laughs> and I just thought, Bria, you She'd listen to the show. Month and it wouldn't be too late. <laughs> you listen to the show. You know it's never too late. Um, anyways. Why do people put up with it? I don't. There's no understanding it. I think they must have just been conditioned. 
over years of, you know, submitting stuff to places and having to wait months to hear about it and then more months to get it published and all that kind of stuff. It's got to be that. She's got a good voice. She we should does. ask her to do characters on the show. Yeah. Have we never? I don't think so, but you never know. We've had some episodes that had lots of people involved, so it's possible. Were there lots of people involved in this one? There was a few. I wouldn't say lots, but our cast list includes such diverse elements as Wendy Cooper as the narrator, Sudden Death Nicole, who's actually known as Nicole Sutta to her friends, as uh, the stagehand. The English girl was played by Catherine Inskip, who we uh, remember hearing previously on In the Gloaming. Gloaming! <laughs> and, oh no, I, I pushed the wrong button, apparently. <laughs> and then, let's see, Rish Outfield played Nerd. Hey! Which you're probably used to by now, I'm sure. Don't. I, I resent that <laughs> remark. Nerds are smart. You, you kept bristling every time as we listened to the story before we started the episode. Every time she just called you nerd as though it was the name. You're like, hey, come on. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, yes, mean, it was junior high all over again. You've got to be used to that by now, I would think. Let's see. What other characters were there? There was uh, Renee Chambliss was the voice of the girl whose body Wendy Cooper was inhabiting. Okay. Veronica was her name. Veronica. 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 <laughs> yes, that one. No more singing, Rish, for the love of Luke Coddington. Uh, that was uh, Renee. And then I played the... Uh, Ian. That's right. The unrequited love that was waiting for her saying, Hey, you know what? I like the plump girls. And you are sickeningly skinny. You. He, he actually <laughs> says, you used to be really pretty. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, oh, I'm sure every woman loves to hear that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> every time I've tried that line, it hasn't worked out for me. Is that all the characters? Is anybody I missed? There were only the two male guys and the one three she, and a half female The, the one she male yes. that was played by you. Write what you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that was everybody. So, yeah, that was our cast list. What did you think of that thing? I remember when uh, Wendy sent us an email and she said, hey, I need somebody to do the the girl voices on this. And I was like, oh, well, uh, we know somebody who's got a, an English accent so we can get her for you. And, uh, oh, there's somebody for the stage hand. She, like, wrote me back. She's like, yeah, I mean, I could get somebody to do the stage hand real easy. I mean, they got two lines and they're short. I need somebody for the main character. And I'm like, pfft. It's a first-person narrative. What are you talking about? The main character is the narrator. And then she's like, yeah, but it's not really her. It's her voice is a squeaky, high-pitched voice, and it's different. And she doesn't. And I was like, oh, right. And so I had Renee do that for us. The multi-talented Renee Chambliss do the high-pitched, squeaky voice for us because most of the girls that we have in our stable... Hey. Of voice actresses. Oh, okay. I thought you were going somewhere else. <laughs> they don't have what you would call a high-pitched squeaky voice. And I don't think Renee does either. But hers is the closest to it. She can put on a high-pitched squeaky voice. Oh, it's a high-pitched squeaky voice. Let's not beat around the stable. I don't know if that's... A, that's probably not that common of a characteristic of a, of a girl's voice, really, is for it to be high-pitched squeaky. Maybe when they're younger... But usually, people tend to grow out of that. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've talked to Renee lots of times, and she's gotten many jobs because her voice sounds so youthful. They're always asking her to read these terrible, I mean, delightful YA novels where, you know, it's a first, first-person story narrated by a 13-year-old. And, mm -hmm. um, she does have a youthful voice. That's well, definitely true. high pitch and squeak. But yeah, high pitch. And, you know, it's like uh, there are certain people... In Hollywood, that are often known for their lack of a good voice. Mila Kunis. I don't know if Mila. I don't really know Mila Kunis that Gene well. Gene Kasem. 
<laughs> Maybe. Who are you talking about? Well, the only person that I can think of that comes to mind is Kathy Ireland. She was a supermodel that did try to be an actor a couple of times. The one that I really remember, there was this movie that she did, like, shortly, you know. She must have been, like, 19, 18 years old at the time. And, yeah, her voice was just so squeaky and high-pitched. It was comical, though she wasn't trying to be comical. And I knew a girl that I used to work with that had the same kind of a problem. She was really, 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 really attractive. Yeah, but what did she look like? Attractive. Okay. But she had this just really kind of high-pitched, squeaky, kind of mousy-sounding voice. She wanted to be a reporter and just, you know, could not pull it off. She was... She'd been in films. She was trying to be an actress as well. And every time I saw something that she was, I saw a trailer for something that she was in. And, you know, I watched it. And then as soon as it got to the part where she did her lines, the people who were watching it with me are just like, oh, my God, what's up with that girl? She's terrible. Um, and it was all just because her voice was squeaky. It's not a common thing, something that really stands out, I guess. I well, thought, I, probably the best example would be Marilyn Monroe. She had kind of a baby talk kind of voice. And because she was so beautiful, I think people let it, let it slide. But there were parts that she would not yeah. be offered. She wouldn't and, work with certain parts. And she was not taken seriously in Hollywood. Although, she, as, as far as I've read, she really worked hard on, on making these characters not Marilyn Monroe. You know, I mean, I'm dedicating herself to her acting, but it was hard to take her seriously. And, and yeah, I've seen stuff with Kathy Ireland in it. I mean, I, I, Denise Richards would be a good example like 15 years later or whatever where you just don't buy her in certain parts because of, well, <laughs> you don't I mean, buy her as a nuclear physicist named Christmas Jones no no I, I didn't <laughs> I, and I think it was unanimous there <laughs> but it's it's like an excess of estrogen or something like that and it, yeah I don't, it contributes I, don't to the, I don't know what it comes from and the thing the funny thing is the girl that I was talking about is so unbelievably really really attractive really really her voice was really cute. All it did was make her more attractive. Oh, okay. But it didn't work to be a reporter or to be a actress or whatever because it makes her unable. You are unable to take her serious. She can tell you about the plane crash with a gleam in her eye. <laughs> but like Marilyn Monroe, she took that baby talk or whatever it was that she did and she made it into something really sexy. This girl was the same way, but yeah, it didn't work as a reporter. You know, a reporter is have that like really deep serious newsy kind of sounding voice and yeah if you've got a squeaky mousy voice and it doesn't work but anyways this is a sidetrack because i was actually trying to ask you a question oh, about okay. what you thought of the fact that the narrator who was saying i did this and i did that but then talked with a different person's voice did that distract you at all we've done it a few times in the past and so i'm wondering if this one worked better or worse you think then the dead of Tetramana, which was narrated by a man, but well, voiced a by a woman and so forth. Yeah, it was Renee in, in that case as well. And I think that one probably was more jarring because it comes as a surprise to the narrator as well that he's in a woman's body. Whereas this one, I think from the very beginning, she establishes that this is not her body and that she has done this before. And she describes her own voice the one that comes out of her as, you know, not as being different from her voice. Uh, but I don't know, because you and I had read this story when we judged it. So, so I knew what was going on in this story. Maybe to the listener, it was more jarring, but I, I don't imagine. You think it was an easy sell? Well, it'd be easier than Dead of Tetramana, because I had Renee making noises and stuff like that while I was talking. You know, it's like I stretched and groaned and you hear, oh, you know, Renee's stretching and groaned. <laughs> And yeah, it's not until he sees himself or, or feels himself or something that he realizes, oh, shoot, it's not me anymore. And somebody could have heard that. And it's just like, what? The noises in the background do not match the narration. But mm -hmm. I don't know. It's have we done time. that any other time? I don't, I don't believe so. I, I don't know. There, there was a story that I had to read for uh, Far-Fetched Fables that was first-person female. And uh, I was reading – I think I, I may have complained about that before on the show where I was reading it and I was like, wait wait a minute. They should not have sent this to me. 
what is going on? <laughs> because I'm talking about my husband and, you know, I had been a good wife and, or I tried to be a good wife. And, and I was just like, oh, no, I got sent the wrong story. But it turned out to be a, a true, not a biological female that I was narrating as. And, and so I was like, oh, OK. But it did change the whole way that I decided to narrate the story. And uh, I'm sure it was Beyond excellent because I did it, but <laughs> did you really say that? <laughs> Still, it, I did question the uh, the editor's choice in assigning it to me. Oh, it's so wonderful to be in the presence of greatness week after week. <laughs> That's what I say when I wake up every morning. Really. Yeah, good. I'm glad that you think that on occasion. Okay, so you had wanted to ask that. Uh, what, what did you think of Wendy's narration? I, I think she's done characters for us before, but I don't remember her ever narrating a story. I, yeah, I think this is her first narration. Uh, she, I'm pretty sure she's played a few small characters. I don't think she's done even a large character for us yet. Is she hesitant to take on parts? Did she not want to be the narrator of this part? I think she wanted to. That was her choice was to do that. I don't think we asked her to narrate, if I remember right. Maybe I'm totally wrong. We're like, you narrate this or else we'll come down to your house. Somebody must be hiding around here. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was her choice to do that. I thought she did a great job. Yeah, I didn't recognize her voice at the beginning. But, you know, that's fine. I just, oh, um, a year from now, she will do all the female voices. <laughs> so. Well, she and Bria. Yeah, she switch and off. Bria. I was going to say, you already got plans for both of them. And also you want them to do voices for us. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? What? Thank you, Nas Merriman. Um, uh, usually we ask them three questions. Do, do you want to just skip the three questions this time? She didn't answer the three questions, did she? Nobody really answered them. They just put some BS on. No, let's. Let, we'll let her do her three questions. We let her do her author's note. Did too, she though. actually record the answers to the three questions? She didn't record the answers. She wrote them. Oh. I bum, 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 bum. Do I have to do these in a girl's voice, a high-pitched, squeaky girl's voice? <laughs> she had a pretty mid-pitched, oh, okay. melodious. So I should do a more mid-pitched, melodious girl's voice for these? Sure, let's try it. Either that or a really bad Australian accent. Which do you do? <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number one. Was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? Ever since I could scribble illegible words. Okay, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> All right. Ever since I could scribble illegible words in my terrible penmanship, I knew I wanted to write stories and books. So yes, writing is fun for me, even when it's really hard. I had a lot of fun taking the three randomly picked words and creating a story. The rules provided such an intriguing setup. As I listened to Rish and Big draw words for each contestant... The suspense of waiting to hear my name and my three words added to the enjoyment. The premise of the contest was brilliant. Three random words. Now make a story. It's great just as a writing exercise. Well, see, that makes me want to do it again. But work is involved. <laughs> you have to write a story when that happens, you know. Oh, I, I, I would write a story anyway, but the reading and judging and then producing and Nah, we'll describing the rules and making a, <laughs> finding that dang bell sound oh. for each one because I don't just like save it so I should save it to the desktop so I can find it again but I have to like do a search where is the bell sound what is it actually called <laughs> we should just get other people to do that for us what do you think agreed <laughs> can we see if Jeremy is uh, is up for finding bell sounds <laughs> bell end number two no I was just calling you Number two, I was. Oh, there. thanks. You were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use the words? Some of the words. Oh, wait, we decided not to do that. No, no it's too sexy, too sexy, no. <laughs> Some of the word combos other people got sounded really challenging. I think I was fortunate because my words outlined a basic plot, at least in my head. That I immediately wanted to go with. I had a vague sense of what I wanted to write beforehand. But after I heard my three words, the story became really clear. It's so rare that that happens. And it did make it easier to write. 
I wanted the words to stand out in the story, too, so I did my best to make them important to the plot. Well, uh, and last of the most important question, who is your favorite doctor? Uh, my general practitioner. No, uh, she says, I've only seen two Doctor Who episodes, but I'm working on remedying that. Thank you, Netflix. One had Christopher Eccleston, and the other had Matt Smith. Between the two, I liked Christopher Eccleston better. Whenever I get to the episodes with David Tennant, I have a feeling he'll become my favorite. We are talking about Doctor Who, right? I, at this point, I no longer remember. We're actually talking about whether you like Dr. Mindbender or Dr. Seuss best. Oh, the cat's eating it. <laughs> so, the premise of this story reminded me of a television show that I absolutely loved in my youth. Did it remind you at all of any television shows that you... Oh, you're thinking of Highway to Heaven, right? Where Michael Landon would go from town to town and help solve problems? Or was it The Incredible Hulk where David Banner would go from town to town and help solve problems? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, it was Touched by an Angel where Della Reese and, and the Irish girl would go to town to town and solve problems. No? I, I, I must not have seen the show. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, it, it was Manimal, actually. Oh, Manimal. Okay, Manimal. I did see oh. that show. He goes to town to town and solves problems I don't think he cat. ever... There were enough episodes that he could make it from town to town. He went to town and <laughs> solved a problem. And then the show was canceled. Sliders. Where people go from dimension to dimension and solve problems. Well, no, there was a show where there was a man who was displaced in time and he would leap into the body of of a different person every episode. And that person had various problems that they needed to overcome. And, and it wasn't until he overcame the problem that he would get to, that he would get to leap into the next person. Okay. Time. This actually sounds familiar. I think I've seen this show. Yeah. It's got that guy that was on Battlestar Galactica. That was like one of the Cylons, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that show. It was a uh, small wonder, right? That's right. And the thing with that show was, you know, he was always trying to get home uh -huh. and, Hoping that each leap would be the leap home. The, uh, the, sorry, the, the next leap would be the leap home. And the fun of that show was just, you know, what kind of scenarios could they come up with of awkward situations? And then how would he bluff his way through without, you know, drawing too much attention to himself as you would if, for example, in this story, you were an air traffic controller, but you didn't <laughs> know how to do that. But people's lives depended on you doing your job. And yeah, the, the, the thing with, with Small Wonder is that I guess they sort of ran out of things for Sam Beckett to do. Once or, he birthed the baby, he jumped there into was a an woman episode, that was yeah. in the middle of labor. They, they pretty much blew their whole wad there and they were yeah, done. Yeah, on the last season, they just, I think the, the ratings were suffering. And so they tried to have a little bit more stunt stuff going on. Like he, he leapt into like a chimpanzee in one episode. And I think he leapt into like a seeing eye dog and he leapt into... Oswald right before the JFK assassination and you know they, so they, each one is just like ooh, ooh hey keep watching Small Wonder guys and uh, ultimately it, it got cancelled but for those three seasons I, I, that was a really solid show yeah I had a good run anyhow I, I couldn't help but think of of that show while reading this story but this feels like it could be a show as well where a woman leaps and they could call it Weight Watcher <laughs> She leaps from hefty sponsored person. by <laughs> sponsored by Slim Fast. Ironically <laughs> enough, she leaps into the, the, each hefty person and then leaves, with, making their lives a little better. I, I, okay, and, make and, that. And, and like what are those guys from like the the Biggest Loser or the the weight the extreme makeovers Makeover. weight loss edition? Like the the trainer guy could be the. Al, was his name Al? Yeah. That, that had the little thing and would always, okay, here's what you got to do. Sam, Ziggy says there's a 91% <laughs> chance you're here to induce vomiting. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why they, well, it was cheaper to get Gilbert Gottfried to play Al. Uh, <laughs> there's a really strong chance. <laughs> and they got different. Maybe a drink the epicat. Different trainers each time. What you need to do this time? No carbs, okay? <laughs> and that would be, jump roping. That would be a very limited series, I think. The whole weight loss thing. <laughs> weight but that, they could totally bring that show back. I mean it. 
They could yeah. bring that back right now with a female leaper and that's still um, named Sam. Well, it could be his daughter. Samantha. Samantha Beckett, yeah. And if Wait. Bacula isn't doing anything, you get him to be Al in this he's, version. He's the hologram and he's like, Okay, honey, here's what you have to do. But that show is writing itself as we speak. <laughs> isn't Samantha Beckett the name of the girl on Castle? It's something Beckett. <laughs> Okay. Is it Samantha? You got me. All right. No, I, I have no idea. I can't remember now. For some reason, it feels like we're stealing the lead character from a different show. Anyways, yeah, that, that show could... It's Sometimes I think it's surprising that certain shows haven't been made into movie versions. Like, they did Bewitched, for example, right? Yeah. With... Uh, Will Ferrell? Nicole Kidman? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and yet... The better show that they haven't done the movie version of, I Dream of Genie. Oh, Bewitched was way better. Than oh, I Dream Genie. of Genie was so freaking hot, though. I don't. <laughs> okay. Well, I. I oh, guess. I guess that's not what we're talking about. Which is well, no. Who would you cast as Genie then? Nowadays? I don't. Who is who is the equivalent of Barbara Eden before you were born? Lindsay Lohan. I don't know who they would cast. <laughs> Whoever the Disney person of. Du jour is, but yeah, it just kind of here. You know, you see old TV shows; they've done like a movie version of lots and lots of them, and I guess it's probably too late for I Dream of Genie because nobody knows it anymore. The they, people they did a Godzilla movie this summer, yeah, but they did a Godzilla movie five years ago, and they did another one five years before that, and another one five years before that. I mean, they keep trying. Okay. To make people care. So at the very least... They did a Peabody and Sherman movie this year. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So maybe that's that. Maybe that. But they wouldn't do a CG I Dream of Genie, I would assume. They would do a live action one, which... And therefore, they're aiming for at least teenagers or older. And yeah, I mean, I don't know how well... Maybe Bewitched didn't do well, and that's why they're like... Pfft. We had I Dream of Genie, and we had Green Acres. You know, they had all these shows planned. We had uh, My Mother the Car. Was that a show? Yeah, a real show. Yeah. You know, you know. See, that was the I thing was, when the previews for I was trying to Peabody think. and Sherman hit. Uh, every kid in the audience was like, "Yay!" Just like Grandpa used to watch. <laughs> I was trying to think of a really lame show. You don't think My Mother the Car was I've lame? never heard of My Mother the Car. I wanted one that people have heard of, but is like totally lame. You'd never make a movie of. What's that one? My Mother the Car! That's the most, that's the perfect example. In the okay. 70 years of television, there's never been a show with a, a premise that stupid that could be so easily summed up with the title. <laughs> We're just like, wow. How could you have ever been nominated for a Parsec? Okay, Mr. Ed, why don't you do that? No, uh, Mr. Ed is actually not... That one would fit with the other ones I was saying. I wanted to say, what's the, the name of that one that had the old guy from Caddyshack in it as the dad, and they lived in San Francisco? And... Too close for comfort. Yeah, okay. See, there's one that's just totally lame that no one would want to do a, a movie version of. It has no concept at all. It's just, here's a family that lives in San Francisco. Go. They're funny. You know, it's like doing black a black honeymooners. It's like doing a who's the boss, Samantha. Even who's Beckett. the boss is more high concept than that too close for comfort show. It's like doing <laughs> growing pains, for example. Just, here's a family. They're funny. Go. <laughs> That's the entire concept of the freaking show. Michael Bay presents Perfect Strangers, the movie. Perfect Strangers on the. <laughs> Perfect Strangers is way high concept <laughs> compared to Too Close for Comfort. Uh, anyways, okay, that end of the outtake. Back wait, to wait, that, Mother the Car. Wait, wait, we have to cut all that out? Okay, so we were talking about Small Wonder, right? Well, we were just talking about shows, and I said it's weird that they haven't remade certain shows. And then you said that My Mother the Car. And that derailed everything. And yeah. But yeah, did you ever th think that that's kind of weird? I mean, I guess there's a time period... That you have to remake something in. Like, you know, the show is popular. And then it goes into reruns. 
And so you have like a 10 year span of people that have watched this show. And then you go about 20 years into the future. And that's when you can make the movie version of it. And if you don't, then it's too late. It's too late to make the Leave It to Beaver movie. Although I think they, they already one. did anyways. And it was not successful. Yeah, but, that but there was that period in the early 90s where they did it with everything. It's yeah, like, they were. Like Beverly Hillbillies, Adam's Family, Brady Bunch. Flintstones, uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Or that one was done in the 2000s, wasn't it? Or was it, it 90s? Was 90s. Yeah, they did that with a lot. Leave it to Beaver, Dennis the Menace, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the right time for it. You know, all those shows, the kids that had seen the reruns of those were still, you know, were about the right age. Even I would have gone to see that. And I was a young guy at the time. So I would have still fit into the, you know, movie target audience or whatever. But if they were to do Pokemon or, you know, any of the stuff that happened after... I wouldn't go see that. I'm older than that. Right, but it's probably the right time to do it now. They've been those talking kids about old. doing a big budget live action Power Rangers movie. And yeah, I, my eyes rolled so hard. I went momentarily blind <laughs> when I heard about that. But it now is the perfect time to do that Power Rangers. It really is. You know, I think I mentioned that to you before. I was at work and there was a comic convention in town and some of the power rangers were there and all these guys that i worked with were all excited about it they're like oh my gosh people oh, like yellow yeah they're like oh this guy was oh he's the oh i loved it oh he was the black ranger i loved him all of a sudden the power rangers were the things that everybody wanted to talk about and i was just like are you guys kidding me did i step into some weird alternate dimension where people gave a crap about the power rangers what is going on and I just didn't understand. It's because they were kids when Power Rangers were new, and so they saw it. And they liked it. It's like... Yeah, it's like when your kids have nostalgia for old Rihanna songs. <laughs> you're just like, uh, no, you're misunderstanding the definition of nostalgia. <laughs> but it, it was a seminal thing for a lot of kids, I guess, the whole Power Rangers thing. Ew. But it seems really crass and really soulless to me, the whole Power Rangers now. And I'm sure the movie will be too, because most of the movies that get made nowadays are crass and soulless. Yeah. But you know that I'll have a huge open weekend just because of the name recognition. And then that's all that Hollywood makes anymore now is name something recognition that, movies. that has a built in audience. Uh, so there, there's no risk involved. And that's why doing a small wonder <laughs> remake all these years later, but with a girl would be brilliant. Right. It could be just like Battlestar Galactica. Now we've got a female Starbuck or whatever, whoever it is. There's a boomer. It's funny that that whole thing, what you, what you have nostalgia for, too. My wife was talking about this to me the other day. People that she works with are much younger. And, and uh, worthless. Yes, that too. But uh, she was saying they they were talking about Backstreet Boys songs. I fudge and love the Backstreet Boys. And they were looking back on them as like, oh, yeah, you remember, oh, this song. And they're the songs from when they were children. Mm. You know what I mean? Before they'd grown up enough to know that, oh, this is a Backstreet Boys song. No, I, I mentioned, I, I did like the Backstreet Boys. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to change my tone. It was crazy. She's just like, oh my gosh, these people actually look back at these songs with fondness. It's they, they, I really liked it, actually. Uh-huh. Uh, and she was, she was just amazed by this. She was just like, you know, it's so weird. And I guess it's just because, you know, we were old enough to know better when Backstreet Boys came out. And no, yet, no, no, no. I, I was an adult, and I, I appreciated the Backstreet Boys coming out. And these kids, you know, they, had, they didn't know better. They just listened to whatever the pop song was that was on the radio. And the kids that are kids now are going to look back and be like, oh, oh, that song by Pitbull and Kesha. Oh, I loved that song. Timber. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, we're old enough that we'll realize what we've got. And Yeah, I, I agree completely, except for the Backstreet Boys part. Uh huh. Anyhow, I guess I, we got onto this because this feels like a series. This feels like something that she does. She has a mission to accomplish, which is weight-related, and then she moves on to the next patient. See, when I first read this, I thought these people were signing up 
<laughs> to have the weight loss, to have this person come into their body and, and do what they were unable to do themselves because it's left nebulous as to why this is going on. And then in listening to it just now, I started to wonder if could, could this stuff be going on in her head? Is she, is she really jumping from body to body or is she just like super, super imbalanced in the way that she sees herself? mentally ill or something like that. Did you get any of that at all in this last reading where it's like, wait a second, maybe I didn't see the mentally ill part, but you did get the whole idea of her in the end. When you find out that she's anorexic too, you kind of understand it a little more, but that she was not seeing things quite the way they are. When she first jumps into the body of this violinist, she's talking like she's got legs like tree trunks and, a belly that went on for miles and stuff like that. And then as the story progresses, she looks and she sees, oh, her legs are actually not bad. They're kind of shapely. And, oh, her face is pretty. And, and oh, wait a minute. You know, she, she starts to actually see what this woman looks like instead of, you know, this, this imagined fat, gigantic woman that she expects her to be. Maybe because she thinks that she's there to help her lose weight as she has been for all these other people, when instead it seems more like the tables have finally turned and this person is switching into her body to help her now is what we find out at the end. You know, this woman is finally figuring out some way that, hey, we got to fix you now. You've fixed all of us. And now here, look at what you've become. You don't have to diet when you're not in someone else's body. Get it? Okay, so so that was what was going on. That's what I saw Veronica had been in the, the narrator's body f- trying to fix things while the narrator had been in Veronica's body thinking that she had to fix things. That's what I saw as the uh, thing. But maybe that, I mean, you That's know, pretty clever. It's kind of left a little nebulous, so you can be however you want. Maybe she finally learned to stop switching while she was there. and Yeah, I don't know. Does this story speak to you because of your struggles with weight? A little bit, yeah. It would be nice to have somebody just take over my body and lose all the weight for me, and then I could come back and not have to deal with it. Because it's a lot of work to lose weight. It's a lot of work to keep weight off, too. I mean, you develop a lot of bad habits over your life. Then to give up on all those bad habits and do you know what you're supposed to is hard. And I've managed to do it sometimes. And I've even gotten way down in weight and then gained it back later, which is really frustrating. But both you and Bria, who wrote this story, are into running. And you've shown an exceptional dedication to to running in this past year or two years or three years or Mm -hmm. life. I think we've talked about that. When When I was into running in that brief period... I wrote stories about weight loss and stories about yeah. struggling with that. And, and I, I think I asked you one time, you know, if you had ever written something about that. And you had. You, you've you written a story about a guy who's struggling with weight loss. And I was just like, wow, that's fun. We should put a collection together. <laughs> but, but my it, story ends badly. <laughs> yes, so, so does mine. Yeah. But all my stories end badly, actually. So that's not a... And not, that's right. There's nothing special for you or is this par for the course at least? Right. So what do you think the moral of this story was? Was there a moral? I love you just the way you are. <laughs> do, do, do. Do, 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 do. That is a good moral. That's it's nice to love yourself as you are. It's su- it's kind of hard to do cuz everybody wants to be better than they are one way or another. Does everybody want to be better? I mean, I, that's that's not a rhetorical question. Well, not quite everyone, but I, I'm willing to bet that nearly 100% of the people in the world have something that they feel like they should be better at. Oh, or okay. Just, that they feel that they should look better or they should, you know, what, they just lose 10 pounds or, oh, if they only played more with their kids instead of ignoring them, whatever, you know, there's thousands of things that we're supposed to do. You know, there's just so many things that to be the perfect person you got to do when you can't. You know, there's so many things. You have to just pick the things. Okay, this, 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 and this is me. These other things, they're just going to have to go. I'm not going to be a perfect chef. I'm just going to have to eat 
microwave chicken nuggets because I, I don't have time to put into it. Once you've <laughs> decided on those things, you actually have, actually have to do them, you know, and actually put the time into them. Like you and I, you know, where we talk, oh, we should be writers, and then we lament the fact that we don't write as much as we should. Yeah, and I guess, you know, somebody could leap into your body and do the things that you want them to do for you, lose the weight for you or whatever, but it's not going to happen. That's fantasy. And yeah, you've got to do the stuff for yourself. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your <laughs> way. Uh, <laughs> but there's something that is really special about doing that. You know, the time that I really did bear down and try hard and I lost a whole bunch of weight and I felt great and looked great and I felt so good about myself for having been in control and having you know mastered myself and accomplished that thing that I accomplished and I'm sure and you know I felt it on a small scale when I actually write a story but I'm sure I would also feel just a huge accomplishment if I bore down and wrote a novel or, you know, wrote for a month in a row without ever, you know, taking a day off or whatever it might be. Get that feeling of accomplishment. That really means something, you know? Well, it seems to me that writing a novel is the equivalent of, like, losing 170 pounds. Where it's just <laughs> like, really? I, I read about somebody who did that once. I'm just like, who has written a novel? I don't know. Yeah, I you know what I mean? It's just like... Pretty in a hundred people, Abby Hilton is the one who's written a novel. You know what I mean? It's just it's it's such an accomplishment because it takes so much dedication and so much self control and planning and all. I mean, unless the novel sucks, which can be the case, but it still takes dedication and planning, even if it sucks. And usually, it's going to suck. You know what I mean? You you write, you know, you take your first basketball shot, you're probably going to miss. The more you practice at it, the better you're going to get. And pretty soon you'll start making it more often than you miss. And so I'm sure it's the same way with a novel. Unless you're Abby, Abby Hilton, <laughs> then the first one's going to be awesome. But there's very few people that are like that. There's not a lot of Mozarts out there. There's just uh, you know regular people that have to practice and learn something before they get good. So I'm sure you know you write a novel and it sucks. We'll write a second novel. Maybe it'll suck less. And a third, etc. I knew a guy who wrote a novel. Oh, you did? Um, yeah, I worked with him once. He decided he was going to quit. He's like, yeah, I've got this job, but I've got, I wrote this novel. I'm going to quit, and I'm going to focus on trying to sell this novel. And, and I was like, really? You wrote a novel? Oh, well, I'm, I, I actually do a, a podcast where we do short fiction, so I'd like to read your novel and see. And I read it, and oh, it was terrible. <laughs> I was just like, dude, I guess it's too late because you already quit, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't have quit. You need to write another novel. But see, I don't understand how somebody can do that. How can somebody write a terrible novel? I mean, to have an idea that's big enough and to actually do the work and do the chapters and write. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of words. That's not something you can do in a weekend. That's not something you can do in a nano frickin' rhymo. <laughs> how, how can you do that? Because it's you... like saying this woman lost 50 pounds terribly. <laughs> All awfully. I mean, just so pathetically bad lo losing that weight. <laughs> it's a little different. There's no quality to losing weight as there is to writing. I'm sure you've read terrible novels here and there. So you know it's possible. As you've read terrible short stories, which were done quicker, but just as poorly. Well, you know, okay. it and, may and take everybody a lot is different. Of I just don't know how somebody can do that. How... And that's probably just because I couldn't do that. I would realize a day in or a week in, I was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is not worth the next three months of dedication <laughs> to. I, I, I can't. I can't do it. I, I know this isn't good. Yeah, I think that's obviously the case with the people that write the terrible novels is they don't know that it's not good. They just have that self-confidence and think this is great. They take a dump. And they're like, yeah, look at that dump. That is an awesome dump. That's the best dump probably ever. Got to have that confidence. I don't know. It would be the same kind of thing as being a, uh, somebody who plays sports, a, a football player or a basketball player or whatever who wants to be a professional. You've got to believe in yourself and think you're the greatest. 
and you know keep working at it until and some people they think they're the greatest but they're not and yet they still continue to think they're the greatest musicians rappers and stuff like that that their songs are all about how they're the greatest whether they are or not that's still what their song's about okay i stand corrected i just yeah i don't have that uh belief in yourself my belief in myself <laughs> or uh that delusion of grandeur but you, I, I, would, I would like to. It would be neat. You couldn't even write an amazing novel because two days into it, you'd realize this is this is not amazing. But no, it is. No, it's not. No, I'm going to have to quit. <laughs> well, you you talked about writing the novel a lot briefly earlier this year. <laughs> and you're like, I don't want to do it. And... I do want to do it. I may actually try and do that. You know, I've, I've been working towards uh, running a marathon this year and it looks like that possibly may be out of the cards for me and so maybe i will adjust my goal to something else get up at 6 30 in the morning and instead of getting on the treadmill i will get on the different treadmill where i type instead i really should when it comes down to you got to do the things that you picked you know what i mean like we were talking about earlier this 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 and this is me i decided this a long time ago that this is me but i'm not doing it and so at some point it's time to actually make that me make that change or cut it loose you know what i mean one or the other you do it or you don't say that it's you i think uh stephen king once said in his on writing book i want to say it was that a writer is someone who writes every day. So far, I eat every day, so I could call myself an eater. I do crap every day, probably, so I could call myself a crapper. Um, I sleep every day. There's not a whole lot of things you do every day, really. I wear clothes every day, so I'm a clothes wearer. Okay. <laughs> we could continue to come up with things that you do every day. Or, or we could let people go their way. Oh, please. Okay, one more thing that you do every day. Because people are just dying to find out. I breathe every day. Oh, wow. I saw a guy who had a shirt once that said, Lifetime Achievement Award for Breathing. <laughs> it's like respirating sense, whatever. <laughs> I saw a guy with a t-shirt that said, I hope I get Hufflepuff, said no wizard ever. <laughs> and I thought about that. I've thought about that for weeks. I'm just like, that is the greatest t-shirt I think I've ever seen. <laughs> you have to really know Harry Potter to think that's funny. <laughs> it is totally the truth, though. Hufflepuff, like, uh, did it even have a name until, like, the third book or something? You didn't even know. There were four houses, but you'd only ever heard of the three I'm sure it was there in the first. And, Raven, and I'm sure that there are were characters that were Hufflepuffs yeah. that were significant. And Ravenclaw you barely even heard of until, like, well into the series. <laughs> Hufflepuff, man. Hilda Hufflepuff? What was the name of the uh, founder? Uh, Helga Hufflepuff. Helga. Ah, so close. I feel we have um, diverged from where we were intending to go. So you're saying we're divergent? <laughs> Did she write a good first novel? I don't think so, but that's just me. Other people must like it. Because there's going to be four movies made from her trilogy. That brings us to the end of the show. What is this? Son, can I talk to you for a minute? Um, okay, Dad. Son, I saw the way you were playing with the other kids today. And I have to admit... I was a little disappointed. Disappointed at me? Well, maybe not disappointed exactly, but concerned. I was concerned about you, kiddo. Am I in trouble? No, son. Not at all. But life can be complicated. Especially as you start to grow up. Stop being a little boy and start to become a man. Dad! No, no. Listen to me for a minute. You see, there are some challenges ahead of you now, and opportunities to either succeed or fail. Some decisions you make will be little ones, like what clothes to wear or what radio station to listen to. What's a radio station? But some decisions will be big ones, 
important ones that will affect the rest of your life. I don't understand. I know you don't, son. That's why we're having this little talk. You see, there are opposing forces in life, my boy. Two sides, waging a never-ending battle for not just my allegiance, but yours as well. You see, way up there, on a distant world, Optimus Prime came about. Optimus Prime the Autobot? That's right. And Optimus Prime wants you to be good and obey your dad and his special friend Byron. He wants you to be honest and loyal and pay attention to rules. But see, there's also another force out there. The force of the Decepticons. The way of evil. And that evil is called Megatron. Megatron? Don't say his name too loudly. Or he's liable to send Ravage or Reflector to spy on us. Now, Megatron, he's not a good robot. He's the worst, in fact. And he wants nothing more than for you to lie and cheat and hit your brother and take your sister's energon cubes away and find ways of using Earth's resources so you can make weapons out of them. Why? Because here's a little secret. Megatron is very unhappy. And he wants you to be unhappy, too. Why is he unhappy, Dad? Because he's very old and very crafty, and yet he's surrounded by dimwits and scum and traitors like Thundercracker and Astro Train and Starscream. The other Decepticons are always second-guessing his commands and trying to wrest control from him or plotting his ultimate demise. Poor Megatron. And no, no, son. Don't feel sorry for Megatron. But he sounds so lonely. Nah. Megatron has Soundwave, the most loyal of the Decepticons. And Menasaur is pretty dependable, too. But <laughs> I'm getting off track. Megatron wants you to do bad things, so you'll be unhappy and can serve as his human slave when he finally takes planet Earth and turns it into a technological hellhole with no redeeming qualities. Like Tokyo. A little like that. But see, Optimus Prime is watching over you right now. And he wants you to be happy and go to live with him on Cybertron and ride hoverboards and bask in the light of his matrix of leadership. Optimus Prime cares about you and wants you to stay away from drugs and the things you find on the internet and people who talk differently than you do. He wants you to be brave and healthy and fight for freedom wherever there's trouble. That's G.I. Joe, Dad. Right, right. Sometimes I confuse my Hasbro properties. But the point is, I want you to obey Optimus Prime and don't listen to Megatron. If you're on the playground and the other boys want you to spit or wear purple or, say, transform into a gun or a tank or a gorilla, you should say no. Always choose a car or a truck or a microscope or an ambulance or a piece of construction equipment. No, no, wait, those were the Constructicons. They were bad. Um, forget the last one. An ambulance. What are you talking about, Transform? You know, when you transition your body into another form, like a vehicle or an animal, you'll know when it starts to happen. How does it work exactly? I don't know, son. But it's more than meets the eye. Dad, are you insane? Did your mother tell you that? Did she use those words exactly? No. Maybe. I don't remember. That's okay, son. Your bionic memory implants may be faulty. Just remember, deep down, all of us are robots in disguise. And friendship is magic. Can I go play now? All right, son. Bye-bye.
That could have been good, but it sure wasn't. Okay, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. I think we've run our course, and so we're going to go ahead and let you go your merry way. Thanks for listening to our show, the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Please tip your waitresses and donate to the show. There's a button on the website where you can just click it and donate to the show. We used some of your donations today to eat Big's final pizza ever. That's right. I may never eat another pizza again. <sighs> but I may still write a novel, so there's that. Mm. There you go. And thank you, Wendy, for producing this episode. Without producers like you, Wendy, I would have to produce. And you don't want that. No and one wants that. No. No. It's worse than small wonder. <laughs> and then uh, thank you, Bria Burton, for writing this story, for entering the contest. And all of you who've listened to the end of every episode, thank you. We salute you. Yes. Tell me why. Fires. <laughs> the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. And the three words that she had were. Uterus. Let me find them. Fetus. <laughs> Uranus. Tongue are changing to try and please me. Oh, it's not even that one. How are the crickets? You can hear them. We can mention that we're recording with the window open because it's so nice if you want to uh, take the... Take the wrong way Take home. the piss out of it. Okay. Switching by Bria Burton. <laughs> it's weird that the narrator and the t title card reader were two different people. Yeah. And that we had like some kind of old prospector through the voice. <laughs> Nerd backed out of the parking space and pulled onto a two lane high. Uh, nerd? 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 Sudden death, Nicole. As uh, the stagehand. Really? Yes. The English one was... No, 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 no. Not the English one. The English one was not the stagehand. The English one was played by... Catherine Inskip. Thank you. I got a crap. That's what I was doing. I was oh. just making that face because... the because nothing gives you pleasure like <laughs> crapping. Right. The English girl was played by Catherine Inskip who we may or may not have already heard. Will we have heard? Yes. Gloaming is the next episode, huh? Gloamer? Oh, and she thank read you. Gloaming. Catherine Lundstrup okay. is from England. <laughs> but, uh, no, no. Do you remember? <laughs> yes, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Wait, just cut that out and go. Tell me about this show. Pretend I never said I know what you're talking about and be like, there was this show. And I'll act all surprised. Go. I remember whether of, of, of a show I could describe that was really infamously bad. Because, yeah, there was a stretch between like 1985 and 90 where if it was a bad show, I watched it. <laughs> <sighs> do you do for Wendy's anymore? There's one that I was supposed to have done a while ago and I forgot to do it and it's still just sitting in there. Okay. Disney song out there yeah. I'm supposed to put in there. And every now and then I see that and I go, oh crap, I haven't done that yet. I don't even remember the episode it goes to. I think it's only one episode back, though. That's how slow we've become again. No, I think it was from the delusions of grandeur that we should record it in here. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. There, you, there, you did say something during the episode, and I can't remember. And it was, just, it, I, it was There was just some line that Ian had at the end or whatever about, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. Oh, oh right, yeah. <laughs> I think I was just saying. I think I was saying something like, "Where she, when she finishes saying, maybe it's time I gained some weight or something like that." <laughs> it's like the, the best story a woman can read because they're all like, "Yeah, I need to gain some weight." Nobody ever says that a woman needs to gain weight for some reason. There was somebody. There's some actress who were just like, "Oh, come on, 
You used to be so poor. Please, just eat. And I can't remember who it was. There was somebody that you and I both had that same agreement with, you know, where it's just like too short a hair and too thin is not attractive. <laughs> There's a fair number of actresses that do that, unfortunately. I guess we're done if we don't have anything else to say. I mean, we can talk about, you know, that there is nobody that's going to leap into your body and do the things that you don't want to do, but you need know you need to do. And But, you know, you got to motivate yourself. And then we can talk about writing for 20 minutes. And, or in, or we could just end the episode and not do that. Nice one, 08OT.